Good evening. My name is Nora Hovsepian, and on behalf of the Armenian National Committee of America's Western Region, I would like to welcome you all to this very important event. First, I want to thank our good friends, Congressman Howard Berman and Congressman Brad Sherman, for graciously accepting our invitation to come here to Holy Martyrs Ferahian Armenian School to address our community and to debate each other on issues of specific importance for us. With roots dating back to the days of the Mayflower, the Armenian American community has grown through waves of immigrants seeking peace and freedom of these shores, either as survivors of the Armenian genocide or later as refugees displaced from far off lands where civil war or revolution erupted or where dictatorship forced them to flee. In the last four decades, America has become home to over one million Armenians nationwide. And our community has not just grown quantitatively, but also qualitatively, as it has become more and more politically active on all levels of government. Just today, there was the Encino Neighborhood Council elections where four very capable and talented young Armenian Americans were on the ballot to be elected. We hope to bring you the results of that election during the course of this evening. We're very <coughs> proud of our candidates for that election, and we are also very proud of our grassroots activism which fueled this achievement. Representing our community, the Armenian National Committee of America has been and continues to be the largest and most influential grassroots advocacy organization for the Armenian cause. We have offices and chapters all over the country, from Washington, D.C. to Boston, Chicago to Houston, Phoenix to Los Angeles, where the largest concentration of Armenian Americans call Southern California home. To further engage our community, the ANCA recently launched the High Votes Initiative, a massive nationwide voter registration and get out the vote campaign, which is registering thousands of new Armenian American voters who will get out and will vote on November 6th and beyond. High Votes volunteers are on hand today to register anyone here who has not yet registered to vote. We are a valuable commodity in swing states, such as Michigan, Nevada, Colorado, and Florida, where previous elections have been decided by small numbers of votes. And since the Armenian American community is generally a cohesive voting entity, we have the ability to influence the outcome in such swing states, just as we have the ability to influence the outcome of the election here in this 30th Congressional District. In every level of government, but especially at the federal level, we have had both friends and foes of the Armenian cause. Unfortunately, those who we thought were our friends have sometimes bitterly disappointed us after reaching higher office or after leaving public office. This has only served, however, to reinforce our drive to ensure that our collective voice is heard loud and clear. Today, I can tell you that the two members of Congress sitting before us have for many years been two of our most consistently loyal and proactive supporters on Armenian genocide recognition, aid to Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, and accountability of Turkey and Azerbaijan for their actions. And it is our hope and indeed our expectation that whatever the outcome of this election, both of these congressmen will continue to support, assist, and advise us as we pursue the Armenian cause. When we first learned that new redistricting lines would pit two of our friends against one another this year, we were deeply saddened and frustrated that we would inevitably be losing one of our steadfast voices in Congress, a voice which has listened to our concerns and which has supported our just cause. Members of our community would ask, who are we supporting in this election? To which we had to respond, it is too hard to make a choice between these two. 
That is when we decided to create this forum, this opportunity for our community to hear from both of you simultaneously as you engage in a frank and open discussion. During this campaign, we have all followed your prior debates on issues related to the economy, jobs, health care, education, and local questions, as you have distinguished your positions on these and other matters that are important to all of us as citizens of this great land and as individuals and active and concerned members of American society. But until now, you have not had the opportunity to debate and discuss matters of foreign policy, specifically matters related to the Armenian cause and U.S. relations with Turkey, with Azerbaijan, and with Armenia. As a community, these are matters which can and in fact do influence our individual and collective decisions on who to vote for. And this is why we are all here today. We are all anxious to get started, but before I introduce our moderator for this evening, I would like to first make some acknowledgments. On behalf of the ANCAWR, I would like to thank US Armenia TV, Horizon Meridian Productions, for helping us produce this debate, and Horizon for live broadcasting, live streaming this to a wider audience, both on HorizonArmenianTV.com and Horizon's YouTube channel today, and US Armenia TV in the coming days. And of course, we want to acknowledge the diligent efforts and expertise of our, our distinguished moderator and panelists, without whom this debate would not have been possible. Thank you all for accepting our invitation. We also want to thank the administration of Holy Martyrs Church and Ferahian Armenian School for graciously hosting the venue tonight. And lastly, we want to thank all of you in the audience for participating in this important event. We are certain that it will be enlightening for all of us. Now, I am pleased to introduce Zanku Armenian as tonight's moderator. Mr. Armenian has more than 25 years of experience leading communications and public affairs strategies for major corporations and high-profile issue campaigns. He currently is Director of Public Affairs for one of Southern California's largest corporations, overseeing stakeholder engagement efforts for major company issues. He serves as President of the Glendale Water and Power Commission and is also a columnist for Los Angeles Times Community Newspapers including the Glendale News Press and Burbank Leader, among others. Previously, Mr. Armenian worked at the Motion Picture Association of America, driving communications programs, and held senior management positions at a variety of public relations firms in Silicon Valley and Washington, D.C. In Washington, he was a founding member of public affairs firm Powell Tate, established by President Jimmy Carter's press secretary, Jody Powell, and First Lady Nancy Reagan's press secretary, Sheila Tate. He also has held positions in Congress and has been very active in state, local, and presidential political campaigns, and he is a founding board member of the California Armenian American Democrats. Please help me welcome Zanku, who will in turn introduce our panelists and the congressman for this evening, and please enjoy. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Zanku Armenian, and I will be the moderator for this evening, as Nora mentioned. In behalf of the Armenian National Committee of America Western Region, I would like to thank you all and the candidates for coming tonight. In this election, the ANCA has not endorsed any one of tonight's candidates over the other and has arranged tonight's forum for the candidates to express to voters their respective positions on issues of interest to the community. It is the ANCA's hope that this will be helpful so that you can make an informed decision on how you vote. For those who might be asking themselves why two Democratic incumbent congressmen are running against each other, 
This is the result of the recent redistricting effort by the Citizens Commission on Redistricting, where in this case, one previous district was eliminated. The reason you have two Democratic uh, candidates running is because of the ballot initiative that passed, which, fall, which allows the two top vote getters in a primary to advance into general elections regardless of political party affiliation, something that is unique in California. This debate is taking place before a live audience here in Encino, California, but is also being taped for future broadcast. I want to make a note, your presence tonight implies consent to the use of the videotape of the debate and the audience for the purpose of being broadcast publicly on TV. Now the ground rules. The debate will be governed in the following format. In a moment, I will introduce our panel of journalists who will ask the questions of the candidates. The debate will begin with a three-minute opening statement by each candidate. This will be followed by questions by our panel. We had a coin toss before the start of the program, and Congressman Sherman won the coin toss, and he is elected to be the first opening statement, which also means that Congressman Berman will be the first in the closing statement. Each candidate will be given, uh, we'll, we'll start with the three, three minutes each, and each candidate will be given 90 seconds to answer the question, and the other candidate will be given 30 seconds to reply. The questions will alternate. With a few questions, we will give both candidates a full 90 seconds to answer because of the importance of the issues being asked. At the end of the debate, each candidate will be given two minutes to make a closing statement. We will do our best to accommodate questions from the audience depending on our time. If you have a question, please write it down on the index cards provided and hand it to our staff. Please keep your questions brief. Staff will be sorting the questions, and we will attempt to work those questions into our program, provided they do not repeat questions already slated to be asked by our panelists. Now let me introduce our panelists. Mr. Ara Khachadurian, who is sitting to my left, your right, has been the editor of the Asparas Daily newspaper, the oldest Armenian daily newspaper in the United States, off and on since 1992, overseeing its growth, from a weekly newspaper to a daily newspaper and launching the paper's website and online newsletter in 1997. Today, with its website aspares.com, its daily newsletter Aspares Post, and its mobile phone application, Aspares is the most widely read Armenian newspaper. Ada also has served as a media director at Rock the Vote from 2002 to 2005 and has been active in local, state, and federal political campaigns for more than 25 years. He was born in Iran and moved to the States in 79. He grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts, has a degree in journalism from Northeastern University in Boston, and has resided in Los Angeles since 1991. Welcome, Ada. Our second panelist is Harut Sasunyan, someone who is, I'm sure, very familiar to many of you. He is a publisher, syndicated columnist, TV commentator, author, filmmaker, and human rights activist. Anything else, Harut, that I should add? <laughs> he is the publisher of the Glendale-based uh, Glendale -based newspaper, The California Courier. His weekly commentaries translated into four languages are reprinted in publications and websites globally, including the Huffington Post. He appears on a weekly political commentary show on U.S. Armenia TV and is also the author of several books on the Armenian Genocide. Sasunyan is the founder and president of the United Armenian Fund, a coalition of the six largest Armenian American organizations which has procured and delivered $650 million of humanitarian aid to Armenia during the past 23 years. As a former senior vice president of Kirk Krikorian's Lindsay Foundation, he also oversaw the implementation of $242 million of infrastructure projects throughout Armenia and Artsakh. Sasunyan served as a human rights delegate to the UN in Geneva from 78 to 88. He played a leading role in the recognition of the Armenian Genocide by the UN Subcommission on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities in 85. From 78 to 82, Sasunyan was an international marketing executive at Procter & Gamble in Geneva. He has a master's in international affairs from Columbia and an MBA from Pepperdine. Please welcome Mr. Sasunyan. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, now let's please uh, welcome the candidates. I'm going to read a very brief background. Uh, the background intentionally does not mention any of the Armenian issues, the many Armenian issues both congressmen have worked on because that would take us another 20, 30, maybe hours to uh, get through. So I've kept it brief. Um, and I'm sure their background and their work on Armenian issues will come out in the answers uh, the, of the many questions that we have for them. Congressman Howard Berman was elected to Congress in 1982, where he was named to the Foreign Affairs and Judiciary Committees. Congressman Berman is the ranking Democrat on the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. He began his career in public service with a year's work with volunteers in service to America. From 67 until 73, he practiced law in Los Angeles, specializing in labor relations. In 73, he was elected to the California State Assembly. Congressman Berman is married and has two daughters. Born in Los Angeles, Mr. Berman attended UCLA, where he received his BA in 1962 and his LLB in 1965. Welcome, Mr. Berman. Congressman Brad Sherman, born and raised in Southern California, represents California's San Fernando Valley and has served in the U.S. House of Representatives since 97. Congressman Sherman is serving his eighth term in Congress and currently resides in Sherman Oaks, California. And I'm not going to repeat the joke, Mr. Sherman. You'll have plenty of opportunities to say it. Congressman Sherman is a senior member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and serves as a senior Democrat on the Subcommittee on International Terrorism, Nonproliferation, and Trade. He is also a senior member of the Financial Services Committee. Before joining Congressman, Mr. Sherman was on staff at one of the nation's big four CPA firms. Sherman, Mr. Sherman is a tax law specialist and a CPA. Mr. Sherman is married and is the father of three daughters. Mr. Sherman received a bachelor's degree from the University of California, LA, and later earned his law degree from Harvard. Welcome, Mr. Sherman. If I could ask both candidates to please come to. Just a couple of housekeeping so that uh, you know how the clocks work. Um, you'll note that the clocks in front of you, Mr. Sherman and Mr. Berman, say 30 seconds. Um, for the segments that have longer time limits, such as primary questions to a candidate or opening statements, I, I will be keeping time on my iPhone for the larger amount of time, but I'll start running the clock at 30 seconds each time. So basically, every time this clock runs, that's your 30-second reminder that you've got 30 seconds more to go before we um, uh, cut it off for the next part of the program. So I'll start with a quote from Martin Luther King, who said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. We are certainly living in challenging and controversial times. Let's see where these two gentlemen stand on those issues. So I'll ask Ara to start with the first question. Oh, sorry. Let's start with the opening statements. Mr. Uh, Sherman. Hello, I'm Brad Sherman from America's best named city, Sherman Oaks. It is great to be back at Holy Martyrs and the Farahian uh, School, where I've spoken so often every couple of years to all of the uh, students here. And uh, I'm glad to be involved in the activities of this school and this church. I'm also proud to have been given earlier this year by the President of Armenia the Maktar Ghosh Award, recognizing my leadership in fighting for American aid to Armenia and for the recognition of the Armenian Genocide. I'm proud to have the endorsement of, a, of Councilman Paul Kokorian, of Ardi Kasakian, and of two ANC West Valley leaders, Nishan Kalukian and Nishan Bostonian. I've got an outstanding constituent service program 
and record of accessibility to the West San Fernando Valley. Due to, uh, as was explained, two relatively similar members of Congress are running against each other. And Howard and I agree on many things and have voted together on many issues affecting Armenia and the Armenian Americans. But there are five issues where we differed. The first was in June of 1995. I was not a member of Congress, but I certainly would have voted with the vast majority of Congress to have limited uh, economic support aid to Turkey until Turkey lifted its blockade of Armenia. Unfortunately, I, my colleague voted with the minority and voted no. A year later, the Vyskovsky Amendment would have prevented Turkey from receiving economic support until it lifted its blockade of Armenia. Over 300 members of Congress voted yes. I certainly would have had I been in Congress. My colleague, unfortunately, voted no. Later on that month, a vote on reducing aid to Turkey by $3 million until it recognized the genocide. I would have certainly voted yes, as did all the leaders of the Armenian caucus. My colleague voted no. April 3rd, 2003 a vote on whether to delete the provision giving an extra billion dollars of aid to Turkey. I voted and spoke yes. My colleague voted no. And finally, another vote that day to reduce aid to Turkey. I voted yes. My colleague left early, so he wasn't able to vote. We are both members of the Armenian caucus. My colleague is also a member of the Turkish caucus. I am with you seven days a week. Sometimes Howard's only with you three or four times a week. The Turkish caucus is the number one genocide denial organization in the United States Congress. It's not something I would join. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Sherman. Mr. Berman. It's always nice to have a guy start out with the positives. Uh, thank you all for attending. And I want to thank the Armenian National Committee of America for this and for the role they play here and their very outsized role in Washington, D.C. For nearly three decades of service in the Congress, I've been an ardent, consistent, and outspoken advocate for the Armenian cause. I've worked persistently to achieve U.S. recognition of the Armenian Genocide. As chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I led the successful effort to win that recognition at the committee level, and anybody who knew what we did there will know how hard we worked to make that happen. We haven't yet succeeded in winning the recognition of the entire House of Representatives, but we will. The upcoming Congress to which I seek re-election will be the final full Congress before we mark the tragic 100-year anniversary of the onset of the genocide in 1915. I will make it a priority to have the recognition of the genocide voted on in the House of Representatives, and I will personally urge President Obama to live up to his exemplary stand as a, uh, in the U.S. Senate and as a presidential candidate and recognize the genocide. Our failure to recognize the genocide is a huge moral stain on this great nation's record. Let me be clear. He has an excellent record as well. I commend him for it. He's been a comrade in arms. The difference between him and me on this issue lies in one word, leadership. As the leading Democrat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I'm in a position to do more for Armenia and Armenian Americans, and I've been doing just that. I've halted the transfer of Senator Ar sensitive arms to Azerbaijan because I grew sick and tired of Azerbaijan's arms buildup, bellicose rhetoric. Just this week, I wrote a letter to Secretary Hil Hillary Clinton about one of the most disgusting actions any world leader has taken within memory. I'm talking about President Aliyev's decision to pardon an Azerbaijani axe murderer who is serving a life sentence for killing an innocent Armenian soldier in his sleep. And not only did he pardon him, he promoted him within the military, he gave him a new apartment, paid him back pay, and celebrates him as a national hero. You know it, the world needs to know it. 
The gruesome murder occurred in Hungary, where both the killer and the Armenian victim were guests at a NATO-sponsored event. So I've asked Secretary of Clinton to make sure, first, that all of NATO condemns Aliyev's uh, action. Secondly, that Azerbaijan is suspended from all future NATO-sponsored activities. Thank you. And third, that thank the you, killer Mr. is, until the killer is stripped. And finally... Thank, thank you, Mr. Berman. Okay. Time is up. I got more. Mm -hmm. We're now going to move into questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some of them are directed at an individual candidate. We will identify those. That candidate will have 90 seconds to answer that, and then that will be followed by a 30-second rebuttal by the other candidate. With some questions, we have allocated 90 seconds to both candidates to answer, and I will indicate which questions those are. I would ask the audience to hold your applause, as it is a bit disruptive as the candidate is trying to get through what they want to say in such a short amount of time. You're welcome to applaud in between questions, but I would just ask that we allow both candidates that um, uh, that room so that they can uh, uh, get through their answers properly and they don't have to speak above the applause. Thank you very much for your cooperation on that. So with that, we'll start with our first question, Ara. This is an individual question to Mr. Berman. Uh, first of I all, I think we know somebody in common. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, I want to thank both of you for being here and from your opening remarks. I think this is going to be one hell of a night and I'm looking forward to it. So thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, we, you guys all talked about the Armenian issues. However, I'd like to start by talking about the recent statistics that reveal that only 11% of CSUN students will obtain their bachelor's degree within four years. With the cost of education rising and less and less students getting to avail themselves with the multiple universities in the district, what is your view on, the, on this and what will you do to change this situation? Mr. Berman. Uh, one of the two or three most critical national issues we have. We know what's happening to the cost of college education in this country. Our public institutions in California uh, have seen a tuition climb of 40% uh, since 2008. Uh, current tuition is at the CSU systems has doubled. Uh, uh, it is keeping people out of uh, going to college and pursuing their careers. For everyone who meets the standards and gets the grades, America should be a country where people are not denied access uh, to university uh, because of uh, the price of that education. And we can't forget about the vocational students and others who don't want the four-year university but desperately need the kinds of skills training. So I'm very strong for one expanding in, uh, our programs for both loans and grants to universities, uh, trying to provide uh, uh, federal assistance in terms of helping these universities, and doing the things in California that correct the ter terrible budget deficits that are really eating at the core of our public universities. Uh, it, it's a critical important issue. Last week, there was a vote to provide visas to graduate students in computer science, math, and technology because we are not producing enough America-born students Thank you, Mr. to Berman. fill those jobs. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Mr. Sherman, 30 seconds. We both agree on how important a college education is. I've taken the leadership position in trying to make sure that students can get the help they need. I helped pass the College Cost Reduction Act, which keeps student loans down at 3.4 percent. I helped pass the Student Aid Fiscal and Fiscal Responsibility Act, which took the bank middlemen out of the student loan process and kept student loan uh, rates low, provided that uh, student loans would be uh, uh, forgiven after 25 years less for those who go Thank into you, teaching and nursing. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Sherman. Uh, I, I will go next. Uh, good evening and welcome. This is a question addressed to both congressmen, starting with Congressman Berman. Uh, as you mentioned, both uh, uh, President Obama as senator and presidential candidate made a commitment to speak truthfully of the Armenian genocide, 
Unfortunately, he has not kept his pledge and he's now asking us to vote for him again. As members of Congress, what will you do to make the president keep his word, if possible, before the next election? So this is uh, to both candidates, 90 seconds each. Why do I want to go back to Congress after 15 terms? Because there is more to do. At the top of my list, and it's a long list of things I want to do, is to get the House to go on record uh, acknowledging and condemning the genocide and then to put all forces together that I can to tell the administration Turkey has to understand. They have to come to terms with their own history. I'm Jewish. The notion that, that in order to hurt, avoid hurting sensibilities, we do not acknowledge the historical truth of the genocide is, is to me, is a horrible, as I said, stain on our country. So I will do everything in my power. Right is right. Turkey will get past it, as they have with other countries. We will continue a relationship with an important country, but it has to be based on the historical truth. Congressman Sherman. Genocide denial is the last step in genocide. It's the first step in the next genocide. That's why it's critical that America recognize the first genocide of the 20th century. Uh, I was the only uh, one of the small group that introduced the genocide resolution that served on the Foreign Affairs Committee and managed it through the Foreign Affairs Committee to a successful conclusion. We did not get the floor vote that we need. And I will go back and I'll work two years, I'll work four years, I'll work as many years as it takes, but hopefully as quickly as possible to get Congress to recognize the genocide. And part of it is for us to uh, reduce the power of our chief opponents in this, the Turkish caucus. When they are able to boast that they have as a member the chief Democrat on the Foreign Affairs Committee, it gives them the credibility that they were able to use last time to argue as they did that the issue shouldn't come up for a floor vote. It is time for us to recognize this genocide in the House of Representatives, and it is time to put pressure on the administration, especially in the next 38 days, to turn to both candidates for president and get a clear statement from them, because Norma pointed out how the Armenian vote will be critical Thank you, in Mr. certain Sherman. states. We should know what they're going to do next April. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Um, I, I am going to use my prerogative, prerogative as a moderator. When there is an accusation of some sort against one or the other, I'll give the other side a 30-second uh, rebuttal. So, Mr. Berman, 30 seconds. You want me to be a member of the Turkish caucus. You want me to have a reach as far as I can have. Every, with the exception of this guy, every key member of Congress who is the leading the effort. I'm talking about Jackie Spear in Northern California and Anna Eshoo. I'm talking about Adam Schiff next door. I'm talking about Jim Costa in Fresno. I'm talking all over the country. Every single one of these members of Congress is supporting Thank me you. in this election, not him. Thank and you, part Burr. of their thinking is because Thank I'm you, the Mr. guy Burr. who can produce the positive result. Thank you, Mr. Berman. I told you it was going to be exciting. Congressman Berman, just uh, going off on that, Secretary of State Clinton, who herself pledged to uh, recognize the genocide if she were to win the 2008 election, recently referred to the Armenian genocide as an historical debate. Uh, shame on her. Uh, she maintained that that position despite letters of complaint from members of Congress. Were you satisfied with her, with her response to your letters questioning her statements? And if not, what is the next step to correct this gross injustice? You know, it's not where we want... I have how much time now? 90 seconds. 90 seconds. It's not where we want to be yet. But the most fascinating thing about the debate on this issue that has changed since the early 1980s is 
no one, no one in the Congress makes the case that the genocide didn't happen. They may argue, oh, we can't hurt our relationship with Turkey, or maybe they're close to some people who are representing Turkey, or they may have other kinds of, but nowhere do I hear now, like I used to hear, this is a historical debate, the evidence is that this was just some intercommunal violence, there was no systematic plan to exterminate the Armenians who lived in this area, and it is very disappointing when our leadership of this country goes back to raising that issue. Maybe you have a reason, but, and, and the biggest problem is if we, you gotta, we, our relationship with Turkey is important for a lot of different reasons, but it has to be based on historical truth. This happened, it has to be acknowledged. The Germans acknowledged it and and for any, particularly somebody who's Jewish, the notion that you can get away with denying this or, or trying to fuzz it up as a historically debatable point is just, in a very fundamental sense, wrong. So I, I am not happy with any issue, anything which Thank tries you. to make this into Thank a you, still Mr. debatable academic Thank question. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Mr. Sherman, 30 seconds. I don't think that um, the Turkish caucus is going to turn, change its mind. I know Howard's been working to change their mind for the last decade. It's not working out. His presence there empowers the caucus. It doesn't change the Turkish caucus. We need to recognize the genocide, be, not only for America, not only for Armenia and the Armenian people, but the Turkish state will never be a modern state until it comes to grips Thank you, with Mr. its own Sherman. history. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Next question for both candidates. Uh, question for both candidates, starting with uh, Congressman Sherman, please. Mm -hmm. In 2010, even with strong bipartisan majority support for the Armenian Genocide Resolution, the House leadership under Speaker Pelosi did not schedule this resolution for an up or down vote of the full House of Representatives, disappointing Armenian American voters. What efforts did you make back then to secure the votes of your colleagues and urge the speaker to bring it to a vote? Thank you. I worked on the floor every day. Howard was there too. Howard had a unique role because he was the chief Democrat on the Foreign Affairs Committee, that is to, in this case, the chairman. I was there every day getting individual co-sponsors getting individual commitments and pleading with the speaker to bring it up for a vote. Ultimately, we did not have signed in writing commitments from 218 members. But the ANC said, let's go ahead with the vote. Those who are straddling the fence will ultimately decide to do the right thing. We went to the speaker. We asked her to bring up a vote on that basis. It didn't happen. We asked on the very last day of the session, and for weeks prior to that, it didn't happen. We need a uh, commitment from both parties to bring it up to a vote and to pass it. Uh, until then, we are, uh, we are in a way not standing tall as the United States of America. What kind of superpower cowers before history? What kind of superpower Worry, worries about Turkish threats. Dozens of parliaments around this world have recognized the genocide. It's about time for Congress to have the same level of courage. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. <laughs> Mr. Berman, 90 seconds. What, what Brad didn't mention as he recited this, and it was an accurate recitation, was to get it out of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I, as chairman, got the consent of an opponent of the resolution, my ranking member at the time, Ileana Anaros Leighton, to allow the role to stay open. And anybody from ANCA who was in Washington, there sure were a lot of Turkish lobbyists and Turkish parliamentarians in the audience, anyone from ANCA knows, I over and over again went to the floor, dragged members back to the committee. Members of Congress sometimes don't want to vote on controversial issues. 
and they will say, well, I'm leaning that way and I'm, I'm doing it. The only way to make, to, to make this happen is to bring up the bill and have the vote. Put people down. And you know what I believe in the end of the day, notwithstanding all the lobbying against it, the economic interests, uh, uh, the friends who are getting nice salaries now, because it's the right thing to do when they have to vote yes or no, a majority of the members of Congress will vote yes. We will go on record. We will then go to the administration with the strength of the House passage and get the administration to acknowledge before the 100th anniversary of this tragedy that this, in fact, was a genocide. Thank you. I'm going to follow up with a question to, again, uh, both of you gentlemen. Uh, we did talk about the centennial of the genocide, and whoever is elected uh, will be a member of Congress during uh, that e event, actually. Um, you're talking about you will make sure that Congress will pass the resolution. If you could be a little bit more succinct in how will you make sure that such a thing happens uh, in order that the same justice is served to the Armenians as it has been with the Holocaust, with the Cambodian, with the uh, Ukrainian, with the Rwandan genocides. Uh, both of you. Let's start with Mr. Berman. Let's start with Mr. Berman. All right, first of all, I can't promise, I can't make sure. All I can use is the skills that God gave me and the experience of the time and I think a track record for pretty, pretty effective to make sure it happens. The current chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee will not be chair next year. Either I will be chair, since notwithstanding what Brad thinks, I'm gonna win the election, or, <laughs> Or a Republican will be the chair. And that Republican very likely will be Ed Royce. Unlike Ileana Ross Layton and Ed Royce, conservative Republican, different party, strong supporter of mine in this election, even though Brad is his ranking member on his subcommittee, he and I will team together to get this up and everything we can to make it happen. And with the leadership on both sides of the committee, I really feel like we can do it. And I know, by the way, I know that many of the people who didn't let it come up in, at the end of 2010, it was a very difficult time, have feelings of regret about that, and I think we will be able to get it up. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Mr. Sherman, 90 seconds. Howard's been there for 30 years. He's been the chief Democrat on the Foreign Affairs Committee for five. Um, it's not working out so well. His idea that um, uh, he's certain to win the election is relatively absurd. The KABC poll released just a week ago shows that I'm ahead with Protestants and Catholics, Jews, those of other religions, and even those who have no faith have faith in my ability to represent this area in Congress. Um, neither one of us can promise an outcome, but I promise you that I will fight and I will keep fighting and I will uh, not rest. And I'll be there for two years, I'll be there for four years, I'll be there for as long as the Valley wants me to be there. I know that this is not an easy thing to accomplish. The ANC has been fighting for it for years. I was the uh, only one of the group introducing the resolution that was there on the Foreign Affairs Committee to, to uh, lead the battle to have the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, adopt that resolution. Now we need to get a vote on the floor. I will not rest. Uh, with your help, I'll be there a long time. With your help, it won't take a long time. Thank you. And if KBC's poll is right, Thank I'll you, be Mr. the one to do Sherman. it. Thank you, Mr. Sherman.
Uh, Congressman Sherman, in 2010, there was a UCLA conference in, in which uh, the legal ramifications of the Armenian genocide were uh, discussed and scholars analyzed various methods for obtaining restitution and reparation for the victims of the Armenian genocide from Turkey. Would you support such efforts by the U.S. Congress? either federal courts or international organizations. So Mr. Sherman, 90 seconds with a 30 second reply. Why, thank you. I would support efforts in that direction, starting with those with valid insurance claims. It is absolutely outrageous that families who are the descendants of those who brought life insurance policies from European and Turkish insurance companies are being told well, we can't pay on the policy unless you provide a death certificate. The genocide victims don't get death certificates and neither do their families. So I think it starts with those companies that were paid or life insurance policies who now have in their files uh, those uh, uh, policies where they know that the insured is was born 120, 140 years ago and still refuse to publish the names of the, of the insured on those policies. Uh, that is why I have joined in a uh, brief to uphold the California law. You know that the Supreme Court may make a decision as to whether to review the Ninth Circuit decision as uh, early as this Monday. And uh, I know that uh, my friend Howard also joined with me in this. We need to uh, uh, make sure that those suits can go forward. And we need to make sure that we disclose to every California consumer. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Which companies aren't paying and which aren't publishing the names of the insured. Thank you. That was a good answer to a question that wasn't asked. Uh, but, um, uh, and here, clearly, genocide, case for reparations. But may I make a suggestion? And I'm open to persuasion about what I'm wrong. Don't conflate the two issues now. Fight on this court case. I'm a, uh, the, ninth, the Ninth Circuit decision is the wrong decision. They've made those decisions Thank before. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Okay. But don't conflate the issue of acknowledgement of the genocide. Thank Let's you, get Berman. that done first. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, Congressman Berman, in fact, the next question that I had plan to ask was about the insurance case, but uh, since we have Congressman Sherman had the opportunity to answer it, uh, we'll give you a chance to answer, and please focus on the following aspect, which is the claim of the Turkish and particularly the German insurance companies is that California doesn't have the right as a state to go against federal policy on genocide, Could you, which is now in front of the Supreme Court. Could you answer that aspect? It's please? a bogus argument. What are we talking about tonight? We're trying to get the United States government to take a policy on the issue of the genocide. Genocide. They don't have one now. So when the German and Armenian, whatever insurance companies, Turkish insurance companies make that argument, it's factually wrong because we don't have a position, which is why the state law and the state remedies for the state residents who have standing to sue should be allowed to go forward because it doesn't contradict our policy. We want to get a national policy that recognizes that this was a genocide. We don't have that now, so that argument is bogus that the federal government already has a position. If, if I can just interject, the only official policy pronouncement of the United States government was the statement of then President Ronald Reagan saying that it was a genocide. So this is not a case where the federal government hasn't spoken. The federal government's last enunciation on this is to say the plaintiffs are right and the German and Turkish insurance companies are wrong. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to follow up again a question for uh, both candidates. I'm going to follow up on this uh, genocide issue. Last December, um, the Israeli Knesset held uh, the first ever hearing on the Armenian genocide, which was initiated by its education uh, committee. Uh, as leading members of the Foreign Affairs Committee, as both of you are, will you call for a hearing uh, regarding the genocide itself and its consequences? Not a resolution, but to have the entire Congress hold a hearing to discuss this matter as we go into the centennial of this tragedy. You mean not the Foreign Affairs Committee, you mean the Congress as, as a it, whole. As a kind of as like the Israeli yes, Knesset yes, exactly. uh, did. Uh, it's the first time I've heard this suggested. Uh, um, I would love for it to happen because I, I would love, particularly, I mean, the last folks from who, who survived from that era are, are leaving us. And I would love for members of Congress to hear what we hear on the committee when we have those hearings. It's a very intriguing idea. It doesn't happen a lot, uh, so I'm not gonna give you a facile answer that says, absolutely, we'll do it, but it, it, it has a credibility because it's about an ultimate issue, genocide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Congressman Sherman. You come, if I understand your question correctly, you have a novel proposal. If there is any rule that allows for it to be done, by God, we should do it. And if there isn't such a rule, by God, we should pass it. In the meantime, what I can guarantee you is a hearing of the Foreign Affairs Committee, just as the Knesset had hearings at the, what I believe was the committee level. No, he's saying it was at the I, yes, Knesset. I level. believe he said the Education Committee of the Knesset. Um, but I would like to see the entire Congress meet. If I understand your question correctly, you were drawing an analogy to the Education Committee of the Knesset. In our house, it would be the Foreign Affairs Committee. And I uh, assure you that, uh, as it happens, I'm in line to become the Chief Democrat on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And I am very confident that we will have full committee hearings on exactly the topic you outlined. Just to... Uh Just to clarify, the hearing that I was uh, referencing did happen in the entire Knesset. It said. was initiated by their education committee. I, again, you I would like to see seconds. both. Okay. Uh, the other question where I'm going to, uh, with Congressman Sherman, the State Department has been using funds allocated for Armenia's economic development to sponsor Armenian-Turkish dialogue programs that are designed to scuttle efforts to pass an Armenian genocide resolution. What will you do to oppose the use of these funds allocated for Armenia for these types of programs that kind of water down this whole issue? Funds for the development of Armenia should be used for the development of Armenia, and funds for the development of Artsakh should be used for the development of Artsakh. And at the ANC's request, I'm leading efforts to try to push uh, for some of the money that we give to Georgia for development to be used for Javik. Uh, I will certainly seek to have the authorizing committee on which Howard and I both sit to uh, require that funds used for economic development of Armenia be used for that purpose and based on your question, specifically state that it should not be used for conferences uh, that uh, have the effect, as you point out, of derailing a recognition of the Armenian genocide. Uh, in addition, uh, I will work with the Appropriations Committee to have their appropriation of foreign uh, aid provide that the money for Armenian economic development is just for that purpose. Thank you. Congressman Berman. Uh, Sometimes one of the problems with our foreign aid is people in Washington decide what they want to see it used for and, uh, and, and pushing an agenda. And part, one of my major efforts to try and reform our foreign assistance program to give more country ownership to some of these issues. I have no argument with dialogue between Armenia and Turkey. I have tremendous argument with you, us using our dollars to support something as if this Thank were still a debatable question. Thank you, Mr. And I Berman. would fight it. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Next question is addressed to both candidates, starting with Congressman Berman. As senior members of Congress, you have a powerful voice in world affairs. What can you do to encourage America's allies, including Israel, to recognize the Armenian genocide? There are a number of things we can do. It's a little audacious for a country that itself hasn't recognized the Armenian genocide to start telling other countries what they should be doing. So, number one, get this resolution passed and, and push and persuade the executive branch uh, to uh, support what the Congress has done. And then you do want to make it into an international consensus, uh, but we are not effective going to tell a government uh, that they should do something that we haven't yet done. So we got to put first things first. Uh, and do I have a little more time? Or? Yes, you do. I do, okay. Let me tell you the, the history of this whole fight for many years. The time is not right. We understand there was a genocide, but the time is not right. We're in a Cold War, and Turkey is a key member of NATO. Uh, it's, Turkey is emerging. Uh, we want to make sure it doesn't go with the Islamists. Um, Turkey is very important for uh, entree into Iraq. Turkey, all this stuff, there is never the right uh, time for Congress to do it in terms of other things. We just have to suck it up because it's a fundamental moral issue Thank and you. do it. <laughs> Mr. Sherman, 90 seconds. Okay. I'm proud that at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, they recognize the Armenian genocide. Proud that the Holocaust Museum in Washington does the same. We need to recognize the Armenian genocide at the U.S. government level. But I, for one, uh, have uh, the chutzpah to urge my Israeli friends to do it even before we do it. And the politics in Israel are a little different. Here there is still this mirage that somehow Turkey is the critical American ally. In Israel, that same mirage was uh, more or less shattered recently. And so we may indeed find that uh, Israel is able to beat the United States in recognizing the first genocide of the 20th century. And given the history of Israel and the history of the Jewish people, I think it's an important thing to do. So I, for one, don't believe we should wait to urge Israel to move forward, but we should be inspired to move forward ourselves as quickly as possible. Uh, before I go to the next question, I would like to uh, clarify something for the record based on the answers that you both gave. Uh, in, we, before we give any wiggle room for the state of Israel to wait for us to pronounce judgment on this issue. I think it, it's well to, it's, it does well to remember that in 1975 and 1984, twice, the House of Representatives, the full House, adopted resolutions recognizing the Armenian Genocide. So the Israel doesn't have to wait for the U.S. to do it first. We've already done it twice. So they can do it once at least in the, in the meantime. Well, is that a... Let's, uh, in, yeah. in the end, a... We'll give you 30, 30 seconds yeah. each. Look, for historical reasons, Israel should do it. Particularly Israel should do it. So the one thing I know, I know Israel and I know Brad Sherman, and they won't do it because Brad Sherman tells them to. <laughs> um, but there is an underlying, there's an underlying moral issue here that I think is responsive. But the problem with the argument about 1984, and I was there for that. We didn't, it wasn't a one-on kind of, one-off kind of an issue. We keep, 
pushing that resolution and our failure to get it keeps getting publicity so that I'm just telling realistically uh, uh, it will be much more effective when we've passed it in, in, in this year now uh, in doing, carrying on this cause. Thank you. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Sherman, I will give you um, 50 seconds um, to be fair on both sides. I know Israel and I know Howard Berman. And I know Israel isn't going to recognize the genocide because Howard Berman tells them to. They're not going to do it because Brad Sherman tells them to. They're going to do it, I hope, because it's the moral and right thing to do and because the historical record is there. And this is not a place for schoolyard put-downs. This is a place where we should concentrate on moving this world in the direction of recognizing the first genocide of the 20th century. My, my next question is addressed to uh, Congressman Sherman. Mm -hmm. The U.S. government pays millions of dollars in rent to the Turkish government every year for the air base, for the use of the air base in Injirlik, Turkey, which is situated on occupied Armenian lands. What can Congress do to stop the payment of that rent to the Turkish perpetrators of the genocide and pay that rent instead to the rightful owners, the Armenians? Um, I wish I could tell you that by paying rent to Yerevan, we'll be able to occupy territory under the military control uh, of the Turkish state. Um, I'm not that good. Uh, we would not be able to continue to use that base uh, if we do not have an agreement with the government that controls the territory on which it's located. Um, that, uh, that being said, I look forward to developing a foreign policy where we are less dependent upon the use of bases in Turkey because I've seen them try to lobby the Pentagon to lobby Congress not to recognize the genocide on the theory that, oh, you need our bases. We uh, uh, can and should uh, to work with our other Southeast Asian NATO allies to have a basing structure that does not rely, that does not require us uh, to be paying rent uh, to the Turkish state. Uh, I doubt that uh, paying rent to, uh, to Yerevan uh, will, uh, will, will allow us to occupy the territory uh, that, uh, you know, that is under Turkish military control. However, as long as, we're as long as our base is on that land, that becomes an excellent argument for additional aid to the Armenian state because uh, we're, 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 we're on that territory. And so uh, there are many reasons why we ought to be providing economic development assistance to Armenia, and that becomes one more. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Berman, I'll give you yeah. 40 I, seconds since I didn't, Mr. Sherman went over. I, I didn't understand all that. But what I do know is one of the arguments made in Congress against the genocide resolution. Oh, Inserlik, we can't, what, the, the Turkish will kick us out of Inserlik. The Turkish have no intention of kicking us out of Inserlik. They want us there. They're desperate to have us there. This is a smokescreen. This is an argument that people who are fronting for the Turkish position use to scare Congress into thinking there will be great dangers to our national security. They will not do that. Now, what's the proper price for rent? Uh, and what should our basing positions be? I don't know if this is what Brad was saying, but Thank you. I'd like to give a little more thought before I would tell you. you I would just withdraw our base from Inselik. I There are national security issues. I think this community is too sophisticated to want me to just say something that sounds good right away but might make no sense. So those are the kinds Thank of questions I haven't heard it proposed before. I'd like to think about before I said, let's get rid of Inserlik. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Sherman, I'll give you a 30-second rebuttal. I don't know whether Howard's listening all that much. Um, I did not say just pull out of Inserlik in an effort to uh, be favorably reviewed in this room. I said, let's develop an overall security plan for Southeast a uh, Europe where we are less dependent. Well, you on said insulation. Southeast Asia. That's what confused us all. I, I said Southeast <laughs> Europe. No, you said Southeast Asia. I believe I said Southeast Europe. <laughs> I In any case, um, 
in, in, in any case, I did not call for the immediate closing uh, of uh, Inserlik. Thank, Thank you. Next question. Next question addressed to Congressman Berman. You mentioned our good friend, the Congressman uh, uh, Royce. Uh, last year, uh, along with Congressman Royce, you led the effort in the House urging the Turkish government to return confiscated religious properties back to the Armenian church and other Christian communities in Turkey. What are the next steps to make provisions of that legislation a reality? If you are reelected, what additional steps will you take on this issue? Uh, using every opportunity, including internationalizing this issue, because we have universal declarations of human rights and the right of people uh, to practice their religion, and these properties were stolen uh, uh, from from the churches. Uh, uh, there are many different ways. One can talk about conditioning uh, a particular sale or a particular assistance package on some specific things. There are diplomatic ways, and I'd like to empower, I'd like the administration to utilize its leverage to make uh, that a real issue. Mr. Royce, by the way, on that resolution, you know who he chose as his chief Democratic co-sponsor, don't you? Me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it, you know, it's not enough to just pass resolutions that the Turkish government can ignore. You have to stand up and say we're going to change our policy toward Turkey. That's why when there's a vote to limit economic support funds to Turkey until they lift their blockade, you have to vote yes. That's why when there's a vote to say that we're not going to provide them a billion dollars in aid, you have to say yes. If you send the message to Ankara that no matter what they do, the American gravy train is there at a time when we urgently need the money here in our own country, we're going to send them a billion dollars, and my colleagues going to vote for it, then they're not going to hear our non-binding resolutions. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. <laughs> Mr. Berman, I, I see rebuttal all over your face. <laughs> a con is a con. This is a guy who every single year votes for a defense appropriations to give aid for foreign assistance for Turkey. He talks about a couple of specific votes, but when it gets down to the bitter thing, it ain't important enough for him to vote against the whole bill. Why? Because there are other things he likes. There are a lot of factors in this. I can't, he's taken votes I haven't taken, he says, and he may be, he may be right, I think he's right. That, if you decide, who to vote for on that basis, rather than on who is the guy on this stage who actually stopped a threatening arms sale to Azerbaijan that could have threatened Thank the you. border patrol uh, stations between Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan, it's me. Thank Who's you. the guy who took the lead in twisting arms to get the resolution out of the Foreign Affairs Committee? It's me. Who's the guy the Armenian National Committee in Washington comes to every day and every week to implement a strategy? It's me. Why? Not because he's bad. He's great. Because I can make it happen. That's the difference. Mr. Sherman, I am going to give you a rebuttal on that one. He can make it happen. Those were his words. Where's the genocide resolution? The fact is, he voted for every one of those defense bills that he attacks me for voting. In the words of Bill Clinton, it takes some brass to criticize a man for doing something you did yourself. The fact is, when there's ever a specific vote on Turkey, not a vote to fund our entire military that has some unfortunate provisions in it, he is saying give a billion dollars of aid to Turkey. A single vote, yes or no. And as for who the ANC comes to every day, you're looking at them. Thank as you. to where, who's going to be effective. As to who twisted the arms to get that bill through the foreign, uh, uh, to recognize the genocide through the Foreign Thank Affairs you. Committee, you're looking at them. And you were not one of those who introduced the bill. I was the only one of the group that introduced the bill. 
that sat Thank on the you. Foreign Affairs Committee, managed the time, gave the rebuttal argument, twisted the arms, recruited the people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now Sherman. you'd like to take credit for it, wouldn't you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I'm going to move us forward from here because it seems endless on this one. Okay, let's, let's move on to a, another critical part of the world. Given the current this, turmoil in Syria and this, elsewhere in the Middle East... Sorry, Howard, this is for Mr. Sherman. I'm sorry, this is a question to Congressman Sherman. Mm -hmm. uh, given the current turmoil in Syria and elsewhere in the Middle East, what steps will you take to protect the Armenians and the Christian minorities in that region? What can Congress and the administration do in this regard? Thank you. I wish I could tell you there was an easy and simple answer to protect the Christians of Syria. Obviously, that's an important thing for us to do. Uh, we have to make it plain to both sides. And as bad as Assad is, remember that the other side has some elements in it that are extremely hostile to Christians in Syria. We have to make it plain to both sides that there will be consequences for not treating uh, with respect the human rights of the Christian minority. We cannot give aid to the Syrian rebels without strings attached. We can't give aid to the Syrian rebels not knowing where that money's going to go. And we have to make sure that only elements dedicated to human rights, to a respect for minorities, that those are the only elements that we're providing aid to. Uh, they, um, uh, there is such a desire to get rid of Assad, uh, such a chance for the United States to accomplish that. It is important to get rid of Assad. It is just as important to worry about who is going to be in power after Assad. Mr. Mr. Berman, 30 seconds. The larger issue is what is happening to Christian communities in that part of the world. Look at what's happening in Iraq, the disappearance of Christians, uh, the persecution of Christians, uh, their desire to flee and go somewhere else uh, because of their fears for their own safety. Uh, look at the issue of cops in Egypt and in Syria, uh, Part of what Assad did and built his despotic coalition was making sure that minority rights generally and, and some, some religious rights were protected. And uh, in all Thank our you. efforts to bring him down, and it is in America's national interest to bring Assad down. Thank you, Mr. Uh, this has to be first and foremost in terms of motivating our spending of money and our actions. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Um, I actually, so there's a, there's a good question here from the audience that I want to uh, jump in here with um, and we'll give uh, each, um, each candidate a minute to answer if we could. Mm -hmm. Is there a mechanism by which humanitarian aid can be directed to assist the Armenian population of Syria and if so, what steps will you take to secure such aid? We'll start with Mr. Berman. Uh, there are mechanisms to do this. There are uh, direct USAID relationships, and there are more covert kinds of ways to ensure that the Christian communities in Syria are being sustained and are being helped, and where they need to be are being pulled out. Uh, and, uh, and on Monday, we'll get to work on seeing if to what extent is that going on now, and if it's not uh, trying to, to get something there going. We are doing things now that aren't talked about in the press in terms of assistance inside Syria. Uh, things are, a lot is going on, but this very specific point, I think I'd want to check on and push. So. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sherman, one minute. Uh, we do need to provide aid, probably covert, directly to the leadership, uh, not only of the Armenian community, but other uh, minorities uh, in Syria. And I have been fighting for the protection of minority religions in the Middle East, co-sponsored the bill to create a particular office in the State Department, 
and have uh, the support of all of the community leaders of the Assyrian Church and the Coptic Church That's here true. in the San, uh, and, and communities uh, here in the Total San Fernando lie. Valley. Total lie. Um, that's because they've watched me in action year after year as I fight to protect the Christian communities in one part of the Middle East and another. Thank you. Could we clarify for the record sure. that it is not true for a candidate to say he has the support of all the Syrian and Coptic church leaders in the valley. It's not true. Um, let's move. It, let's move forward. Let's move forward. Okay. Well, Next question. Okay. A question addressed to Congressman Berman. Congressman, what is your reaction to Israel selling billions of dollars in arms to Azerbaijan, and Azeri leaders declaring that they will use these arms against Armenia? What are you doing to discourage such imminent threats to Armenia? Well, I'm very concerned about. Uh, the leadership of Azerbaijan, the statements they're making, they're getting more aggressive and, uh, and really bullying than they have ever been in the, in the last year or two. Um, I am concerned about that because in Israel's understandable desire to find friends and allies in the Muslim world, they cannot be helping to assert. By the way, and I'm also concerned about arms relationships to the extent they exist between Armenia and Iran. Their governments do some things that are, they think are in their national interest, which have very negative repercussions. And it's up to us to be able to tell our close friends certain things that are going on and have to stop. Mr. Sherman. I'm very concerned about the bellicose rhetoric and arms expenditures of Azerbaijan. That's why just a few days ago, I wrote the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense, urging that we cease uh, all aid and arms transfers to Baku for several reasons. First, as we've discussed earlier, the outrageous uh, treatment, uh, outrageously favorable treatment given to the axe murderer. But second, the bellicose statements from Baku that Thank they would you. shoot down airplanes going into the new Nagorno-Karabakh airport, which I commend Nagorno-Karabakh for being able to build. Thank I you. Uh, think that we have to look carefully at this. The uh, uh, Howard does, is the ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, I'm in line to have that position next year. He says he's used that position to block one arms sale to Azerbaijan. You can be sure I'll do a lot more than that. Thank you. Um, since Mr. Sherman went over his 30 seconds, Mr. Berman, would you like 30 seconds? Well, Brad, ha Brad would like to be in line. I don't think he'll be in Congress, but he has his polls and I have mine. But Brad would like to be in line. What he fails to tell you is there's one thing you need before you can become ranking or chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. You need the votes of your party caucus. Okay, next question. Uh, if I may. Not uh, a problem. Yeah. Next question. Yeah, if, if I may, I would like to uh, say something for the record. Congressman Berman, you, you just m made a reference to, our, if I heard you correctly, uh, arms uh, trade between Armenia and Iran. Uh, if, if I may, sir, with all due respect, uh, as far as I know, there are no arms trade between Iran and Armenia. There was one incident where there was a, a, a smuggling of arms that was uh, wrongly transferred through Armenia from a third country to Iran and to Iraq. But as far as I know, there's no ongoing existing military relationship between Armenia and Iran. I do not know of any ongoing military uh, relationship between Iran and Armenia. Uh, other things best be left unsaid right now. Let's let's move on to the next question, Ada. 
Uh, we've kind of touched uh, on it, and I'm going to uh, go back to you, Congressman Sherman. You said that uh, you wrote the Secretary of State asking that uh, we stop selling arms or, uh, you know, the aid to Azerbaijan because of everything else uh, that's happening. Yet we've been fighting for this parity in aid in uh, mm -hmm. Congress. So I guess uh, for a country that is... Uh, Oil, rich in uh, oil resources and is allocating seven times more money to its military than uh, Armenia is. Why is there that provision uh, in there to sell arms to Azerbaijan? That's A, the first part of the uh, question. And then Armenia uh, has a, a interesting geostrategic uh, place in that region, bordering Turkey, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Iran. And the fact that it ha it, there's the second largest US embassy in the world in Armenia after Iraq. Um, when is Congress, or uh, uh, both of you as members of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, going to tr treat Armenia as a strategic partner rather than uh, going through these tedious processes of the protocols, uh, you know, the peace processes that are obviously not working out. What will you as members of Congress do to reverse that course and actually treat the entities in that area as they need to be treated? Well, I know that uh, some advocates for Armenia have urged parity between the military aid uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. I don't believe in parity. I believe in zero for Azerbaijan. Uh, this is a country whose bellicose statements indicate a tendency toward uh, uh, aggression, and it's a country that certainly doesn't need American dollars uh, when they have all that oil. So we should not be providing any military aid to Azerbaijan, period. And based on what happened in Hungary and based on how this murderer was treated when he returned to Baku, uh, we should not be uh, conducting uh, NATO um, exercises knowing that perhaps the next soldier who is uh, de uh, hit with an ax in the head and killed might very well be an American soldier. So um, for us to be uh, conducting military cooperation with Azerbaijan uh, would be to ignore uh, the acts uh, recently involving the soldier and would be to ignore the bellicose statements of Baku, and I don't think we can hide our eyes to that any longer. Congressman Berman. Thank you. Well, Mr. Berman. What do we want here? Number one, we want to get official U.S. government ongoing permanent recognition for the fact that a genocide occurred and all the things that should flow from the fact that that occurred. Secondly, we want to make sure that Armenia is secure and that Nagor as the people of Nagora Karnabakh get to determine their own future. Um, Friends of Israel don't like that arms sales go to Saudi Arabia. Um, the world is a complicated place. Not every, these fights are long-term struggles. Yes, I didn't get it through the House in five years, but you got to keep trying. You got to keep pushing. You got to understand what you did wrong. We sometimes make foreign affairs decisions based on economic considerations. It's not right. It, it's but it's the way the world is. So, Azerbaijan, with its resources ends up getting stuff they don't financially need for security threats they don't really have uh, because of their economic clout. We try to deal with that, we try to change it, we try to push it, but that's a powerful force and it always has been in every country's foreign policy. We Thank like you. to think America's foreign policy also considers some fundamental human and moral values in determining it, but it's always a blend. May I, just, may I just follow up, and I guess uh, I could 
throw this to uh, both of you. You talked about economic development. Europe has moved forward considerably in uh, establishing comprehensive trade agreements with Armenia. In fact, they just met uh, last month, I believe, to talk about the lifting of the visa regime and doing all sorts of things. Why, why hasn't the U.S. done that? And uh, as members of Congress, what will you do to advance a comprehensive U.S. trade agreement with Armenia? Well, I would love to work with Brad on getting a free trade agreement for Armenia, because I know how supportive he is of those kinds of things. Um, that's a joke. Uh, the, the, I'm, I'm, you guys get me the information and I will get to work. I want to be accessible to you. Where we can help with visa processing, where we can help with uh, Millennium Challenge uh, issues, where everything else, you get the information. I will call the head of USAID. If necessary, I'll call the Secretary of State. I'll call the National Security Council. I'll use my relationships there, which are pretty strong, and try to help make these things happen. You, it, part of this process is you being my making myself accessible to you and the community, and you give me specifics of things you think are in interest. I meet all the time with Armenian officials and officials from Nagorno-Karabakh. Not many members of Congress do that uh, to learn from them about what's happening. And I have frequently then taken action with USAID or State Department after doing that. That's what a good congressman should be doing, and I'm prepared to do it on these issues. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Sherman. I'm not here to promise a new level of accessibility because I've been incredibly accessible to the ANC, to the people here, and to the people of the West San Fernando Valley. That's why most people in this room know that if they just visit the concerts in the park, Warner Center, and are willing to forgo listening to one tune, they can come up and talk to me. I've met with the, the, the ambassadors and the foreign ministers of Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia and the president of Armenia, and I look forward to a new level of trade between our two countries, and I will work to make sure that happens. But as to accessibility, it doesn't take a political campaign to get me to promise accessibility. Thank you. Let's go back to question 17. Uh, could I, since there was a... Aspersion cast. Sure, I'll give you 30 seconds. Is there anybody in the Armenian National Committee that has asked to come and meet with me and I've refused? I, he puts words in my mouth. He creates straw men and strikes them down. I've been accessible uh, to this community and to the community I've represented and most particularly the Armenian community since I've been in office. And people who are active in that know that. He creates a false premise and then tries to uh, play with it. It's a cute little trick and he's full of them. I'm going to ask that we move on. We've got several well, questions I, I think on I need issues. To respond to that. We'll, have, we'll have time at the end to throw more I, of this I, out. I think I need to respond to that. Okay. 30 seconds. It's one thing to say you'll meet with the leaders of the most prominent Armenian American organization and that's what makes you accessible. I'm accessible to the individuals who are here who may not be leaders of the organization. I'm accessible when somebody has to call Yerevan to try to get our embassy to give a visa. And, of course, I'm accessible to the leader, the national and local leaders of the ANC, the foreign minister and the president of Armenia, etc. Thank you. <laughs> Congressman Berman, as you know, every year Congress allocates millions of dollars in humanita humanitarian aid to Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh, but very little amount of that aid actually reaches Karabakh. What would you do to ensure that this money allocated by Congress is actually used for that purpose and not withheld or siphoned off by the State Department? I will do even more than I have been doing because the issue you raise has been of great concern to me and I've had a number of conversations about all these artificial, when you don't let a USAID official go into that area, you can't deliver the aid. So it's great, oh, we're going to provide aid to Nagorno Karabakh and then we create all these barriers and all these restrictions which make it an empty promise. 
I, we're going we're gonna to change that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sherman. I've requested language be in the Foreign Operations Appropriations Bill to require USAID to actually spend money on humanitarian development in, for the people of Artsakh, for, Nagorno, for the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh, and I'm pleased to report that the committee has included that language uh, in its report. We have, I have raised this issue with Hillary Clinton when she's testifying, when the entire foreign policy world is watching, and made it plain that there's at least one person in Congress who, when he gets only a few minutes with those lights, is willing to say it's about taking care of the people of Artsakh. Thank we you. got the language in, and I will continue to fight to see that the money is actually dispersed, just as in my first year of Congress. I was the first to introduce Thank you. Uh, a provision to require aid to Nagorno-Karabakh. Thank you. Next question is addressed to both candidates, starting with Congressman Sherman. Mm -hmm. We spoke repeatedly about what happened with the Azeri Axeman mm -hmm. and the uh, atmosphere that created as a result of that mm -hmm. in uh, negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan on the uh, faith of, of the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. Mm -hmm. uh, given this barbaric murder and the racist anti-Armenian rhetoric that has come out repeatedly and more recently in, uh, from the Azeri leaders, do you support the full independence of the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh? And how should this uh, tragic episode be reflected in our nation's policy on Nagorno-Karabakh? What will you do to make sure that Nagorno-Karabakh becomes an independent state? I think Nagorno-Karabakh is an independent state. <laughs> Period. It's time to put an, em an embassy in Stepanagar, or I, I apologize if I didn't pronounce it correctly, but you get the sentiment. Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh is a state because that's what its people have clearly indicated they want. And when you look at the American Declaration of Independence, it says, that, uh, it, it lays out the criteria that should be used to determine whether a people can uh, declare their independence. And yes, if you look at the tyranny imposed upon the colonies before 1776, we had a right to our independence. But if you look at what was happening to the people of Artsakh, they certainly have a right to their independence. So Nagorno-Karabakh is an independent republic. Thank you. Mr. Berman, 90 seconds. The people of Los Angeles don't get to decide Nagorno-Karabakh. The people of Nagorno-Karabakh get to decide, in my estimation. Mm -hmm. Self-determination for the people of Nagorno-Karabakh is the critical issue. The fact is, I'm, I have no doubt that they want independence, and that's where I would like to see the process headed. But we are in a negotiation uh, process that the government of Armenia and the government of Azerbaijan have agreed to. I'm watching what's going on in that process. I'm watching the way the Azeris are behaving and the way the government is. For Nagorno-Karabakh to get the status that I believe its people want, it would be a mistake for Armenia to pull out of this process. Let, let the Azeris and the way they have been behaving and the bullying and the military threats and the conduct uh, we just saw, let them show themselves to be what they are and that's the way we will make this happen faster. That's my own personal feeling about the best advice. I agree with Howard. It's for the people of Artsakh to decide whether they're an independent country. They've decided. They are. And it's time for Howard to acknowledge that. The Nagorno-Karabakh is an independent republic. And I believe that the negotiations should continue. But the more America does to recognize the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh, the stronger will be the negotiating position of the Armenian side in those negotiations. But let's... 
before we before we get out to sing the thing that folks would like to hear the most, let's try and get some darn USAID workers into Nagora Karnabakh so the humanitarian aid can be delivered. Let's let's take care of these things and do it sequentially to make life better for the people there. Because isn't that what this is all about? For the people there to have their own destiny as part of a greater army, the community to have their right to determine for themselves. Let's build the building blocks to make it happen, not not go a place that we know is not going to happen in the immediate future. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Sherman, I'm going to touch on this whole uh, Safarov incident with the axe murderer going mm -hmm. free. Uh, one of the interesting things that came down the wire yesterday is that Hungary seems to be upset that since this whole situation, it, uh, its ties with the U.S. have uh, suffered. However, Good. from where I'm sitting, uh, Hungary has been given a pass. Uh, starting with the Secretary General NATO and also some uh, very tacit statements from tepid statements rather from the State Department. It has a major share of the culpability in what has happened. What uh, can the Congress do in order to ensure that Hungary lives up to its responsibility in this uh, situation? Hungary was at least negligent in releasing this axe murderer. Um, we need to keep that in mind when we have military to military relations with Hungary. The safety of our servicemen and women depends upon our partners being competent and being careful and not releasing axe murderers or creating a circumstance in which others might believe that they can commit such a terrible act on Hungarian soil and then uh, be sent home to a hero's uh, welcome. But that shouldn't blind us to the fact that the primary culprit is Azerbaijan. They are the ones that in, that, in theory, said that they would incarcerate this criminal. They are the ones that, in fact, uh, glorify his bloody acts. So I think it should affect our military, to military relationship with Hungary. Uh, but I think that the primary culprit is Baku. In all due respect, here we may have an issue we disagree on. My belief, I can't prove it in a court of law, but watching the way Hungary's behaving lately, my belief is they did not do this negligently. They knew exactly what was going to happen when they released this guy under this so-called treaty, number one. And, 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 and they knew that all that talk about the treaty would not be the way uh, the Azeris behaved. They were, they were acting to help Azerbaijan, doing something Azerbaijan wanted. Who knows why, who knows what for, who knows all the political or economic reasons, but they foresaw the consequences of what they would do. That's not negligence. That's, in effect, an intentional uh, decision. And, and you know something? Because this ax murder happened at a Partnership for Peace meeting, Every single NATO country, and that includes Hungary, has, I think, now an obligation to suspend Azerbaijan from participation in per partnership for peace activities until this, is, this wrong is righted. Thank you. I'm going to give Mr. Sherman 30 seconds. I use the phrase, at least negligent, with a little bit of an upturned lip to indicate, yes, indeed, this very well may be an, an intentional act. And as I stated earlier, uh, several days ago, I sent a letter to the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense saying uh, that Azerbaijan should certainly be suspended uh, from this kind of military cooperation. Thank you. Next question. Congressman Berman, the Armenians in uh, the Javakh region of Georgia and elsewhere in Georgia continue uh, to face intense persecution and pressure from Tbilisi. What will you do to protect the Armenians of Georgia from official and non-official acts of repression 
discrimination and intimidation? What will you do to ensure the economic development, cultural identity, and local autonomy of the Armenian region of Javakh within a pluralist, democratic, and multi-ethnic Georgia? Well, number one, I'm going to wish it were in my power to ensure all those things. But it, it, it doesn't work like that. Every issue you raised is a very serious issue. It's a true issue. I have raised them with the Georgian ambassador, with the Georgian prime minister, and, and I will certainly uh, with Saakashvili the next time I happen to see him. The last two times I've tried to see him, he won't see me because I keep wanting to talk about the persecution of Armenians inside Georgia, as well as the systematic and fundamental violation of Fund of political rights of people, other people who are living in Georgia. He came to power as a great Democrat. It was one of the most exciting revolutions, uh, uh, transformations of power. Uh, uh, the whole world was watching and hoping, and all of a sudden, he is moving into behaving in a more and more problematic way with less fundamental commitment to democracy and more focus on ethnicities. Uh, Georgia has its own problems. Russia, occupation of Ossetia, uh, uh, Abkhazia. But for Georgia to earn our support as a fellow democracy and all the things they want, including NATO membership, they got to rectify the situation. And I'll make the case. I can't ensure it. All I can try to do is use my offices to help make it happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Met with the Georgian ambassador several times. President once raised this issue. Um, the U.S. aid should be focused when we give it to Georgia on the Javak region. I join my House colleagues to request that the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Foreign Operations provide that at least 10 percent of all aid to Georgia be targeted to the Javak region. I'm pleased to report that the House Appropriations Committee recently marked up the foreign aid bill not, uh, with language requiring the State Department to develop a strategy for future development for the Armenian populated Javak region. Georgia exists as a country in part because of U.S. support. Uh, they have a little problem with Russia. They have depended upon us and they should not uh, think that they can continue to depend on us if they are uh, uh, unwilling to recognize the human rights of the Armenian minority within Georgia, particularly that in Javik. During the February 29 hearing uh, with Secretary Clinton before our committee, I raised this very issue and I had get, got her assurance uh, that she would look at it. Uh, I uh, use every opportunity to push uh, for the protection uh, and economic development of Javik. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Berman, I gave Mr. Sherman a little extra time. Would you like to add anything? I think this is an issue we agree on. Thank you. Good. So I think, uh, by my estimation, are we at the last question? Yes, it's okay. this will be, this will be my final last inning. Question. Uh, Congressman Berman, the CBS 60 Minutes show recently featured Turkish Gulen movements, hundreds of publicly funded charter schools in the U.S. The Turkish charter schools, I've heard Gulen movements. I've heard about this. There's yes. a movement that, uh, what's it called? Um, Gulen. Yes. Gulen. G-U-L-E-N. Yes. And it was featured on 60 Minutes. These uh, schools bring in Turkish teachers to the U.S. to teach courses, including English, at a time when the Los Angeles Unified School District is laying off American teachers. One of those schools is nearby using Birmingham High School facilities. Do you think that Congress and federal and state agencies have an obligation to investigate these controversial Turkish charter schools? It is a very bizarre story. This, this, I, I've just been hearing about this in rel relatively the last few months about this movement. Um, I want it, to, it's my nature to try and fully understand something before I sort of shoot off my mouth. And I hate over-promising. I hate over-promising. So 
before I, I don't know anything about them using Birmingham High School. I gotta, I gotta do some independent verification. But the notion, when we talk about, wouldn't it be nice if the Armenian High School could be, have a facility paid for by the taxpayers of Los Angeles? I don't think you do. Uh, you're, uh, you, my guess is there's a huge amount of community support to make this school work uh, because you don't have the taxpayers' funds to go. So to the extent we're subsidizing something like that, it raises a very interesting question. I'll pursue it. I didn't watch 60 Minutes. I've got to investigate what you're talking about. As part of your question, you seem to say that citizens of Turkey were giving, being given work visas to teach, in the, to teach English in the United States. Uh, I know too many very qualified uh, American citizen and permanent resident English teachers to think that we'd be granting work visas on the theory that someone was going to come here and speak English. Uh, and so I look, uh, look forward to looking at this as well. And as to supporting this school, I uh, can't say that I've been able to make the LA uh, uh, taxpayers provide material help, but I've been here to teach a course in Congress for an hour every couple of years, and I'll keep doing it. Thank you. We are a little bit over our time. So we're going to move into closing statements at this point. So we'll start with Mr. Berman for two minutes. Well, I want to thank you for, for providing this forum. Uh, and I just I fundamentally make my case. I've been in the forefront of every important cause of concern to this community for more than a quarter of a century. I'll continue to fight for U.S. recognition of the genocide as we approach the 100th anniversary. Uh, it's not just my commitment as a congressman, but as a Jew whose own people suffered its own genocide because the world ignored yours. I will continue to fight for the rights of the Armenian church and the Armenian people who live in Turkey, the remnants of once great community decimated by barbarity. I'll fight for the right of self-determination and well-being for the people of Artsakh, and which was part of the ancient kingdom of Armenia. And I'll continue to welcome their leaders when they come to the halls of Congress. Again, I go back to the original question. If this is to be decided by who you can get a flag from easier, or a comb, or who you've met more, I can't compete. But I believe when you look at the people who follow us the closest and who share your views, they will tell you, not that one of us is good and one of us is bad, but I can, I, I get it, I can get it done better. I'm more effective. That's my case to you. I think I can help you more back there. And you do, you must understand that I, I go back for a number of reasons. There are many issues I want to work on, but a very big part of it is to finish the work that we've been trying, the fight that we've been trying to fight to get that resolution passed. I will. I will use all my skills and all my contacts to make it a true priority for me in the next Congress of the United States. Look at your closest friends in Congress, with the exception of my opponent, who obviously cannot be part of that group. Adam Schiff. Thank you. Jackie Speer, Anna Eshoo, Ed Royce, Elton Gallagher. They all think I'm the right guy. I'd ask you to consider me. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of reasons why uh, this or that member of Congress will endorse somebody because they're higher up in the pecking order. But I have the endorsement of people who focus on Armenian-American issues. Paul Kokorian, Artie Kasakian, and others who aren't going to say, well, he helped me on the ag bill or helped on redistricting. They're watching what I do for your community. And one gentleman stands up here and talks about how effective he is and how he's going to deliver. He's been doing this 30 years. He has not delivered. He hasn't delivered because of the tactic. It is not a good tactic to vote for unlimited aid to Turkey no matter what they do. It is not a good tactic 
to join the Turkish caucus and to remain in the Turkish caucus and to lend your position as ranking Democrat on foreign affairs to enhance the credibility of the number one genocide denial organization in the United States Congress. It is not a good approach to have your staff take free trips paid for by the Turkish coalition or to take money from your campaign, for your campaign from the Tur Turkish coalition USA PAC. That's not the best tactic. That's why you haven't been able to deliver. It is not a good tactic to hem and haw about whether Nagorno-Karabakh is independent. It's time to recognize its independence and start the negotiations from there. I'm not in the Armenian caucus three days a week and with the Turkish caucus two days a week. I'm with you seven days a week. And with your help, I'll be there for you seven days a week for another 20 years if I go to the gym. Here in the San Fernando Valley, maybe people get us confused, but it, people in the Valley know it's Brad who does things the Sherman way. Thank you. Um, In fairness, uh, I'm going to give 30 seconds to uh, Mr. Berman since there were some accusations made. If you think I carry the agenda of the Turkish caucus three days a week and the Armenian caucus too, if you buy the venom and the smears and the lies of those distortions, I, there's nothing much I can do. Talk to your folks who know me and who work with me. Some of you are in the room. Many of you are in Washington. I'm the, we, we haven't eliminated poverty. We haven't eliminated a war. That doesn't mean we're all failures. We keep trying. A fight that's worth fighting requires time. All I'm telling you is in the areas where I've worked, there's very little question about who could be more effective back in Washington. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. I'll give Mr. Sherman 30 seconds. I work in the San Fernando Valley, and I have the endorsement of every elected official who lives in the district, except for one who worked for Howard for 15 years. And as to whether uh, I'm, he, uh, the Turkish caucus uh, viewpoint is being carried, a vote to, uh, uh, with a small minority, when only one quarter of Congress would vote to give Turkey aid even while it blockades Armenia. One of that little one quarter was my colleague Howard Berman. Thank you. And what billion dollars of aid came up for a vote, that's a difference. You can't change Turkish policy while continuing to give them unlimited Thank aid. Thank you. Thank you. I want to. I want to thank all the members of the audience. Uh, I want to thank uh, the two candidates. I appreciate it. It's been a, uh, more than I think I promised about in terms of standing up, so I, I do appreciate your patience with us. I do want to invite uh, Nora Hovsepian up, the chairperson of the Armenian National Committee Western Region Board, to say some closing uh, remarks. And I'll put her on a clock of one minute. <laughs> okay, some closing announcements. Uh, first, I want to again thank Horizon Meridian Productions for live streaming this very educational event, US Armenia TV for airing this debate, Zanku Armenian for so ably moderating it, Ara Khachadurian and Harut Sasunyan for asking very pointed and important questions and especially Congressman Berman and Congressman Sherman for enlightening us. A few more announcements. First of all, tomorrow, the High Votes campaign is having a voter registration drive at the Glendale Youth Center behind St. Mary's Church in Glendale from 12 to 5 in the afternoon. Please go volunteer, sign up new voters, and enjoy the barbecue. Also, the ANCA Professional Network is hosting a destination weekend, October 5th through 7th in Las Vegas. And we have our ANCA annual banquet on October 28th at the Beverly Hilton, where Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid will attend and accept the Freedom Award. The biggest announcement, 
If I can have your attention, as you all know, all politics are local. Our grassroots activism has succeeded. And under the leadership of the ANCA San Fernando Valley West chapter, I'm very proud to announce that the Encino Neighborhood Council now has four new Armenian American members. And I'd like to ask that they come up to be recognized. John Tashjan is our new public safety representative. Haraki Tsinyan is our new volunteer and service representative. Talar Dardarian is our new planning and land use representative. Congratulations. And Viken Chelebian is our religious organization's representative. And by the way, in case you doubt, in case you doubt that your vote counts, one of our candidates won this seat by only 16 votes. So get out and vote. Vote on November 6th. Look for the endorsements of the ANCA for our candidates. Make our collective voices heard and continue to vote beyond November 6th as well. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.